Okay, we want to just address uh, where we left off in thinking of, uh, we talked a little bit about the peace breaking, and we, right at the very end, we spoke about the peace faking, and that's to the other side of that um, diagram, and um, you can look at this diagram if you have one of these. Um, it's nice and colorful, and it's nicer than the one that's in the other booklet, and you can kind of look off of that one. But you see there that it talks about the responses of conflict. The op opposite of those that would uh, fake the, and this is kind of where we left off. I'll just mention this again. The escape response of peace faking. Uh, these are used when we are more interested in avoiding rather than solving the conflict. And oftentimes that's what happens. We try to avoid the whole thing and we don't want to discuss it because we know it's going to hurt feelings or we know problems are going to arise and sometimes that what has to happen is the truth has to come out and sometimes it is painful uh, but we need to get to the bottom of it and uh, to be able to resolve it in a biblical way a uh, common misconception among churchgoers is that conflict is wrong not all conflict is wrong uh, because of this thinking they try to escape from that conflict altogether. And we looked a little bit about the idea of denying and uh, running from the problem, ultimately suicide. And then we want to just focus a little bit on this attack response, the peace breaking. These are used by people who are more interested in winning than resolving the conflict. They're more interested in getting their way. They're more interested in, and, and, and I have to say that probably many of us have been here where we've tried to resolve the issue our way and we wanted to solve the problem and we wanted to win. Could be a husband and a wife situation, could be a brother in the meeting, could be at work, whatever it might be, uh, we need to really search our own hearts and ask ourselves, have we been to this place where we, we, it says here that they, they're more interested in winning than resolving the conflict. And they view the conflict as a contest. And generally it's used by those that are strong and self-confident. Uh, but they may use, be used by weak and, and fearful. Um, they give off the, the aura that they're strong and confident. But a lot of times we find out that they're really not. The goal is, their goal is to bring as much pressure to bear as possible to eliminate the opposition. Now, to put that in a practical sense, how does that happen? Well, we, we could, in a very practical way, if I can get as many people thinking alongside of me, and so I go around and I make sure that everybody is thinking the way I'm thinking, and I get as many people on my side, now I come and, boy, I can fortify my position because... Everybody's thinking my way. That type of philosophy is wrong. That is a peace breaker, not a peacemaker. Trying to get many people on board with my ideas and how I'm thinking is, is really not in a way that's going to bring glory to God in the, in, the, in the first place. The goal is to bring much pressure to eliminate any kind of opposition. The uh, principles here, the assault... Uh, the first thing is using force to, or intimidation in the form of verbal attacks or physical violence or efforts to damage, to, to damage one financially or personally. We think about some of these things that were just said. Using force or intimidation. How many of us have experienced that where there's been those that have tried to force the issue, force their point by trying to intimidate? I used to know a man that... that he was a basketball coach, and I remember that when he would try to get in an argument with the referee, he would always get up on his toes like this to the ref, trying to intimidate the referee. Well, they're not going to be intimidated. They wear stripes. I mean, they're not going to be intimidated. Anybody that wears stripes is not going to be intimidated, all right? So, so they've got the authority. They've got the whistle. They've got the stripes. They're not going to be intimidated, but this man would always try to do that. He'd step on his toes, and he's tall, and he would step on his toes, and he'd look down at him, trying to intimidate him. It's not going to work. And, but this is one of the things that does happen. The intimidations come sometimes in the form of attacks, sometimes physically, 
sometimes um, other ways. And we probably, some of us have experienced that at work or wherever it might be. Litigation, taking somebody to court um, is another way. And then ultimately, the, this idea of murder. This includes harboring anger and contempt in our hearts toward others. You know, when we think about this, and, and we put this here, uh, this includes harboring anger and contempt in our hearts toward others. Probably none of us, I hope, I trust, none of us are going to go get a gun and shoot somebody for disagreeing with us. But what does the Lord say about in our hearts? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What about having such contempt for somebody, not being able to be in the same room with that person, having that kind of hatred? Isn't it the same as murder, as far as what the Lord's concerned? So we, we may not pull the trigger, but our hearts are there. And so the challenge for us is, is are we on this line? And I'd like to just pause with this thought and have you turn with me to the book of James for a moment to think of some verses along this line and really what is needed for us. What is needed at this point? And uh, the book of James in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, he mentions this, and we've read some of these verses already. He says in verse 16, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And then going into chapter, uh, verse 17. Uh, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle. Listen to this. Willing to yield. Wow. Willing to yield. Willing to give up my own way. This is wisdom from above. The verses we didn't read prior to, to this in chapter 3 talks about the wisdom that's from below. Man's wisdom. And he says that wisdom from above is first pure. It's concerned about the righteousness of God. It's peaceable. It's gentle. So it's not trying to intimidate. It's not trying to break uh, somebody. Uh, it's not trying to break peace. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And then it says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So again, he connects this thought of righteousness and peace together. He says the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. But then listen to verse 1 of chapter 4. And this is really where we want to get going to. He says in chapter 4 of James, verse 1, Where do these wars and fights come from? come from among you. Where do these wars and fights, or if you will, these conflicts, where do these things come from? And that's a real question for us. The word fights is prolonged disagreements or prolonged arguments. In other words, Things that go on and on and on and on. Things that don't just get laid to rest, but things that just keep, we keep bringing up and we keep stirring up and we keep stirring up. We haven't for forgiven. We certainly haven't forgotten. And we haven't forgiven. And we keep bringing it up. And it keeps going on and on and on. That's the actual word for fights here. So he says, where did these conflicts come from? He says, he goes on to say, Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, prolong conflict. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask, but you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasure. So he says, where is your de real desires? He says, the thing of it is, you, you ask, but you're asking amiss. Your prayers are going up to the ceiling, and that's about as far as they get, because you're really asking for your own way. You're not really interested in the righteousness of God. You're not really interested in the glory of God. 
Where do these conflicts come from? They come from within my own heart. Right here. And we all have it. And he says here, notice, strong language, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? It's an interesting term. Because now what he's saying is he's saying you've aligned yourself if this is your thinking and this is what you're dealing and how you're dealing with conflict. What you've done is you've aligned yourself with the world. Now you've brought yourself into friendship with the world because of your thinking. Because of your desires that are down deep in your heart. Because you're solving a problem just like the world solves the problem. So he says, adulterer and adulteresses. Strong language. And he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, enmity against God? He says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He says, or do you not think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. See, the spirit of God we mentioned before, the spirit of God indwelling every one of us. As believers, those of us that have put our faith and trust in Christ, the Spirit of God indwells us. And the Spirit of God is yearning jealously for us to be right with one another so that we can enjoy the relationship with God. Because what we have to realize is that if, if I'm not forgiving you, if something's not right here in this relationship horizontally, what makes me think that my relationship vertically is going to be right? What makes me really think that if, if this is wrong, that if I can't, the brother that I can see, if I can't get along with him, how am I going to really be in a relationship with one I can't see? But by faith, I believe he's there. Or put it another way. If I can't speak to my brother or to my sister in a proper way, or to my wife, or whatever the situation might be, in a God-honoring way, without that in my heart coming up against them, then what makes me think that I have open channels in prayer to my Father? I'm asking a miss. Because if this isn't right, this horizontal relationship isn't right, then this is not going to be right either. And so there's a real challenge that he puts before us here. And so he says, here's what needs to happen. Verse 6, he says, but he, the spirit, dwells in us and yearns je jealously, but he, God, gives more grace. Aren't you glad for that? How wonderful. Where sin abound, grace much more abounded. Amen? And so it, we find it here again. He says, he gives much more grace that no matter what the problem, what that is telling me is that no matter what the difficulty I may have against my brother or against my sister, no matter what that difficulty might be with that employer at work or no matter what that difficulty might be with my spouse at home or with my child, or with my father, or my mother, or whoever it is, whoever I have that contention with, no matter how great that contention might be, His grace is greater than that contention. And His grace is sufficient. And He can come in if I'm willing to let Him take control of the situation. And notice what He says. He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud. You know that's a military word? The word resist? It's a military word. It means that he opposes the proud. God says, there's no room for your pride, Tim, to come into my presence. I can't accept you with that pride right now. You got to get that dealt with. Now, we're accepted in the beloved. We're not talking about our salvation here. We're talking about our relationship. And we need to just make that and establish that. We're talking about that ongoing fellowship in that relationship. Okay? And so what God is saying is that he opposes the pride, the proud. We look in 
Proverbs chapter 6, right? And we're reminded that in Proverbs chapter 6, he says six things God hates. Oh, you mean God hates? Absolutely. There's six things listed in Proverbs chapter 6. There's actually seven. He says six things God hates, yea, seven. And guess what the first one is? A proud look. A proud look. God says, I resist the proud. I am militarily opposed to the proud. It was pride that caused Lucifer to be kicked out of heaven, to be cast out. It was pride that caused Adam to give up what God had given him and hand it over to Satan. That was pride. Because what did Satan say? Oh, God knows this. As soon as you eat of it, you're going to be just like him. Oh. Okay. And he ate of it. Eve ate first. But who does God hold accountable? Adam. It was pride. They say to us that pride is the last thing that dies in us. Pride is the last thing that goes. But it's there in every one of us, isn't it? And sometimes it's an ugly thing. Sometimes our pride is ugly. Sometimes it's, I hate it in me. But we all have it. And what do we need to do? If we're going to have relationships with one another that glorify God, if we're going to be able to resolve conflicts, and I know I'm emphasizing this much, and I'm not really getting into the how-tos as much, but we can't get to the how-tos if we don't realize God says, I oppose the proud. You got a problem with somebody? Do you know it takes two to fight? It takes two to have a conflict. It takes two. Husbands, don't you hate it when I'm, I'm revealing myself here. I hope that's okay. But don't you hate it when your wife doesn't fight back? I mean, you, you're ready, right? And she doesn't say anything back to you. And, and you just kind of, well, that spoils everything. It takes two. And if I'm willing to lie down, if I'm willing to be like that old fable where the two goats are on the mountain and they're coming at one another, you see, so often we're like this. We're two goats and we're both so proud. We've got these antlers and boy, they look good. You know, these horns up there. And I guess deer have antlers. Goats have horns. And we have these horns and they look good. And so we're proud and we're not going to, are you kidding? I'm not going to back up and I'm not going to bow down. And so what do they do on that mountain road? They just do this. And what's needed for one of them to do this? And let the other one do this. Oh, but our pride resists that. But what does God say? Right here in our verse, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. His grace is sufficient. In that problem of difficulty that we might have with that brother, that sister, with that wife, with that husband, with that son, or with that daughter, he gives grace to come in. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Paul says, well, who is sufficient for these things? But our sufficiency is in God, he says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So he says, I give grace and I give it abundantly. That same grace that's able to save us out of the depths of hell is the same grace that's able to deliver us from the depths of my own pride. And he says he gives that grace and he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. So in order for me to really be humble, it's not a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to be the humble one here. I'm going to give up my rights and I'm going to be humble. Well, I've already blown it because now I'm proud of my humility. 
But what it is, is, is I want to submit. Oh, God, please help me. Help me to submit to you. Help me to submit to the word of God. The word of God says I shouldn't be contentious and I shouldn't be in, in uh, op- opposition with my brother. Help me to submit to you. Help me to bow down before you. Help me to let it go and let you be God. I want to submit to you. He says, submit to God. It's not a matter of thinking lowly of myself. That's some people's definition of humility is thinking lowly of yourself. No, it's not. Because as soon as I think I'm thinking lowly, I'm really proud. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. Humility is allowing God to be God. Humility is me submitting to God's word and saying it's not about me. God, it's about you being glorified in this situation. I just want to glorify you. And if it means that I have to be stepped on, then so be it. Because my Savior was stepped on when he was here. I just want to submit. Because my Savior said, not my will, but thy will be done. He submitted to God. And he humbled himself all the way to the cross. And so, real humility... It's not, you first, brother. No, you first. No, you first. No, you first. That's not humility. It's nice. It's very nice. But real humility is submitting to God. And he says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. You know, we have an adversary, beloved. But notice here he says, he doesn't say, he doesn't call him the adversary. Do you notice that? He says, resist the devil. What's the word devil mean? Accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. Yeah. See, the the words that the Spirit of God uses are very particular. He's talking about relationships with one another. And what the devil wants to do is he wants to get me to accuse you of something so that the unity isn't being enjoyed. And so if he can get me to to accuse you of something, then he knows he's got a foothold. He's got a beachhead right here in the assembly. And scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, be angry and sin not. Oh, I like that verse. That means I can be angry. My problem is, is that most of my anger is never righteous anger. Most of my anger is because I didn't get my way. Most of my anger has to do with my pride. Bottom line. It says, be angry and sin not. And then what's the next verse? Give no place to the devil. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Give no place to the devil. That's in Ephesians chapter 4. Reminding us that the devil wants to get his foot in the door of every assembly. The devil wants to get his foot in the door of every home. The devil wants to get his foot in the door of every Christian testimony. Whatever it might be. And he says, don't give him a beachhead to work from. Don't give him a place where he can set up home base, the camp, the home base, where he can throw out his fiery darts in all sorts of different directions. Don't do it. He says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why? Because greater is he that is in me, as I'm submitting to him, than he that's in the world. Isn't that right? So he says, submit, resist, and he'll flee. And then number four, he says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, he's... You can't have the mind of the world. The world says, I'll get even with you. You can't have that mind. That's a double-minded man. A 
And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, Scripture says. So you can't have that double-minded. He says, what you need to do, what I need to do is cleanse my hands. Purify my heart. Align myself with God's righteousness and God's way of thinking. And then he says in verse 9, so verse 8 really, at the, in the middle of verse 8 where he says, cleanse your heart, your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart. This is confession. But notice this, he says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and, and your joy to gloom. And we said, well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like a very nice Christian life. Letting my laughter be turned into mourning and, and, and lament and mourn and weep. What does that mean? What it's really telling us to do is what's really needed in order for us to have the relationship horizontally that we need to have for the testimony and the glory of God is that there needs to be repentance. That's what this verse is telling us. That there has to be repentance amongst the people of God. And if there's not repentance, oh, you know, we can say, well, we're sorry. We're sorry. But is sorry the same as repentance? Is being sorrowful the same as being repentant? No, it's not. Judas, Judas was remorseful, Scripture says. He was remorseful, but he went out and hung himself. Judas never repented. Judas never got to this point where he repented. Repentance is agreeing with God's word and God's judgment and God's righteousness. That's what repentance is. Repentance is, I agree with what God says and I'm turning from this direction. In other words, he says, lament, mourn, and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. He says, Give evidence of a change of heart in your life. And he says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He's not going to keep you there. He's going to lift you up. He's not the type of person, we're the type of people that will kick somebody when they're down. But if there's true repentance, the Lord's going to lift us up. So he says, where did these wars, where did these things come from? This, this attack response that even can happen with Christians, where does it come from? It comes from within here. And James deals with it very clearly. And so it's a real challenge for us. Look at verse 11. I just want to touch verse 11 before we leave this. He says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Isn't that something? He reminds us, he says, listen, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're really repentant and you really changed your ways, then make, make this agreement with yourself and with the Lord. I'm never going to say another bad thing about that brother. I'm never going to criticize that sister. I will never say a negative thing about my wife. I will not say a negative thing in public about my husband. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if I really repented, then I need to show it. And he says here, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a, of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. And then goes on. But I just want to underline this thought that out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaks. You know, sometimes we'll say something. Uh, we used to teach our kids this, and probably you did too, uh, Sometimes we'll say stuff and then we'll say, just kidding, right? They'll make an insult and then they'll say, oh, just kidding. JK, that's what the kids say now. JK, just kidding. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Not if you take scripture serious. Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. There's probably some truth to what you said. Oh, you might have been kidding a little bit, but there's probably some truth down there somewhere, what you're saying. So it's a real challenge, isn't it? 
Now that I've made everybody very uncomfortable, we'll move on. Response to conflict. The peacemaking response. Peacemaking commanded by God. It, it, it's, we need to understand that God desires us to be peacemakers. It's empowered by the Gospels. It's a direct, directed toward finding a just and mutual agreement, solutions to conflict. Peacemaking is divided, and we, we've divided it here into six categories. Okay? Uh, the overlooking, there are some things, there are some conflict, there are some sins that we can overlook. Proverbs says, there's that verse here that, that says, um, uh, a man's wisdom gives him patience, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 19. It's his glory to overlook an offense. To, to be able to say, well, you know what, yes, that's, that wasn't right that Brother Tim did, but I'm going to overlook it, and I'm going to just leave it alone, and I'm not even going to worry about it anymore. It's to your glory to overlook offenses. Well, you know, it could be that Brother Tim was just having a bad day. And I'm just going to overlook it and I'll let it go. And there are some things that can be overlooked. And in the idea of peacemaking and the idea of personal peacemaking, to overlook an offense, disputes that are insignificant should be resolved by quietly and deliberately overlooking that offense. There are some things you just... It's not important, just let it go. And I'm sure that we all can think of examples of such a thing. It is a form of forgiveness and it involves a decision to let that conflict go. It's, I'm not going to dwell on it, I'm going to leave it with the Lord. And I'm just going to leave it with Him and let Him have it. The idea of overlooking the offense. And I'm sure there's many scriptures we can put to this. And then there's the rec reconciliation. An offense that is too serious to overlook, it has damaged a relationship and it requires reconciliation. It has damaged your relationship with that person or perhaps it's damaged another person and you've seen it and you're offended because of it and so you're involved because you've seen it and it's too serious to just let go. There's been hurt, there's been damage and now we have to come in and there has to be reconciliation. There has to be that uh, bringing it to the attention of the offender. Then there's this idea of negotiation. Once the uh, uh, relationship, a relational issue are settled, the material issues may need to be worked out. And there are situations of offense and, and loss and retribution and things of that nature. Uh, negotiation is a cooperative bargaining process that seeks to satisfy the legitimate needs of each party. Okay, we could probably spend a lot of time on, on all these things. Um, just back up. If these, personal, if, if these personal peacemaking strategies fail to resolve the issue, then we move on to the assisted peacemaking strategies. Most conflicts can be stopped at the personal level if we would submit ourselves to God. Most conflicts do not have to grow beyond this. There are some that we have to get help. But most, if dealt with properly and according to Scripture, most could stay here. But looking at the assisted, the Matthew 18. Uh, maybe we can just turn to Matthew chapter 18. And we'll read those few verses there. Matthew chapter 18. You know, when we think about this chapter, oftentimes when we come to this section in dealing with personal trespasses, we extract the, these verses, which I'm about to do now, we extract them out of the context of chapter 18. And we need to see them in the context. Chapter 18 begins with an argument about who's the greatest. Isn't that really the bottom line? That's, that's really the problem is we worry about who's the greatest. And this whole idea of personal trespasses comes within that context. So if I don't care about who's the greatest, then much of the conflict is, is going to go away. 
So we just need to see that. And then notice that it says, moreover, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's that personal trespasses that we've been talking about. You go and tell him his fault. Now, notice this, and let's keep this in mind. In Matthew chapter 5, he reminded us that if I remember, if I'm at the altar, and I remember if I'm at the breaking of bread, for example, just an application. If I'm there in the remembrance meeting, and I remember that a brother has something against me, well, it's good to examine my own heart before I get there. And if I would do that more often, and I knew that a brother had something against me, then before I get there, I'd want to get that settled, right? Matthew chapter 5. But here, Matthew chapter 18, it's a little different. It's not so much that I remember the brother has something against me, but now I've got something against the brother. It's, it's, it's personal, and he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. But let's keep in mind, I don't go and tell him with a hammer. I go and tell him with the idea of building a bridge. The story is told of a man that, that uh, two farmers were, lived next door to each other, and they uh, were brothers. And they lived right next door, and they shared tractors, and they shared everything. And then one offended the other. Something happened, and, and one got offended, and, and, uh, and so they weren't talking. And they would just go and take the tools and keep them, and, and then they'd sneak back on the property and take the tools again. And, 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 and they were offended with each other. And along comes a third man, and the man comes in, and he comes to the farm one day, and he says to the, to the uh, one farmer, to the older brother, he says, uh, do you have any work? I'm a carpenter. Do you have any work for me to do? Ah, I got an idea. He says, you see this? This used to be a meadow right here. And my brother lives next door. He's mad at me. And he came, and he took his tractor, and he dug a stream separating our property. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to build a fence. I don't even want to look at him anymore. I don't want to look at his property anymore. I want you to build a wood fence. He said, see that, see that wood over there? All that wood I want you to use, I want you to build a fence. So the man says, okay, I'll do that. He says, I'll, I'll get you situated, and then I've got to go to town. When I come back, the fence should be done. He says, okay, good, good, good plan. So off they went. By the time the man came, comes back, the older brother comes back, he looks, and he couldn't believe what he saw, that it wasn't a fence of separation, but instead it was a bridge that the man had built. The carpenter built a bridge over the stream to his brother's property, and he says, that's not what I want. He said, what are you doing? And, and then he saw his brother coming up on the steps on the other side of the bridge. And he was meeting, and the, the carpenter was there in the middle. And he was meeting, and they came. And the brother, with tears in his face, and he stuck out his hand. And he says, forgive me. It was a bridge of reconciliation. And then the farmer says to the carpenter, he says, hey, I've got other things that you can build. Why don't you stay here? And, 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 and work on my farm. And he says, no, I've got other bridges to build. Now, that's a story. But are we a bridge builder? Are we a fence builder? Which are we? He says, if your brother sinned against you, you go and tell him. It's all about the attitude. Again, it's about how we tell him. And then he says this, if... if if he hears you, you've, you've gained your brother. Isn't it a sweet thing to have a relationship restored? I tell you, I'm one that my wife hardly ever gets mad at me. Hardly. She's been mad at me. And I've hated it when it happened. But when that relationship is restored, oh, how sweet the sound. Right? And what a wonderful thing to know that everything's right between me and between you. And you've gained your brother. How sweet that is to know that there's nothing between us. That all has been forgiven. And it's as it should be. It's wonderful. And he says, but 
If he will not hear you, and this is where the assistants come in. If he will not hear you, take one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let the word, every word be established. So we have here this idea of mediation then, bringing in outside party to assist in communication and exploration of the options. The mediator may ask questions and give advice, but they have no authority to force a solution on the parties. And after all, we really want the Spirit of God to work, right? So there's this idea of mediation. And there's this idea of coming in and trying to help. But then it says, in the next thought here, is the arbitration. An outside party who listens to both sides and then imposes a binding decision on both parties. Now, in 1 Corinthians, they were taking things to a public court. They were taking things before an unbelieving court. And he says, listen, if there's things that need to be settled, don't go to court with one another. Don't take each other to law. Well, you're going to have an unbelieving judge make a decision. If there are two believers, get this thing solved. So he says, accountability. This takes us back to where we left off in Matthew. He says the idea of accountability, if a professing Christian refuses to be reconciled, the Lord Jesus commands the church leaders or, or the, the elders to come and to, take, to, to hold him or her accountable to Scripture. Matthew 18, 17. Direct church involvement with the, with the brothers involved is viewed as negative, and yet, if it's applied biblically, it can be a key to saving relationships and bring about justice and peace. We lose sight of the fact that all, let me emphasize that again, all discipline of any kind is for the restoration of the person involved. Whom the Father loves, he chastens. And so discipline, even church discipline, is not because we're trying to get rid of somebody because they're a troublemaker, but it's because we love that person and we want to restore that person to usefulness in the assembly. So no matter what that might be. So we have this idea of accountability here. And then observation. But let me just back this up. He says in verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, Tell it to the church, but if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So it's very serious. It's a very serious thing. And we want, it to, we want to get it before it gets to that part. Observation about the diagram. As one moves clockwise, going back to this slippery slope, as you move clockwise on that diagram, you see that responses become more public. And when the private approaches fail, more people who must get involved. When there's conflict, we want to try to keep that conflict as small as possible, with as few people involved as possible. And then when you do have to bring in others, it has to be people that you have confidence in who are not going to take one side or the other. And I will just throw this out. The book of Proverbs in chapter 18 reminds us that he who judges a matter before he hears both sides, to him it is folly. And so we cannot make a judgment on a situation until we hear both sides. So we're brought in. Maybe we're brought in to try to help. We need to listen and we need to allow the Spirit of God to work. One of the things that I think is most helpful in, and I've sat with people, I was with, I was with some brothers just a few weeks ago and, and trying to mediate between two brothers that were offended with each other. They had a problem. They asked me to come in. I sat with both sides. I listened. And then I said, is it correct that you said this? Yes, that's what I said. Is that what you heard? I asked the other brother. No, that's not what I said. That's not what I heard. I didn't hear him say that. Ah, so communication's a problem. Okay, so is that what you meant? 
Okay, that's what he said. And that's what he said he meant. Is that what you heard? Yeah, I heard that now. Say, okay. So we're good with this point. Let's move on. And we went to the next thing. Same problem. Now this one didn't hear what this one was saying. He heard him, but he didn't hear him. And a lot of problems can be solved in that type of mediation to make sure that we hear, to ask, is this what you mean? Is this what you're saying? Can I get this right? Maybe I'm having a hard time understanding what you're saying. Ask for clarification. Okay? So, thinking of on the extremes, we're faced with death. On those extreme, assault and, and flight are similar in that they avoid the real issue. The litigation is really professional assistance, denial under attack. All right, so let's just close this up. Contrast of the responses. A difference in focus. The escape response focuses on me. I want to escape this situation. The attack response focuses on you. I want you to suffer for what I'm feeling. So I'm going to attack you. The peacemaking response focuses on us. Let's get this thing right so that we can move on for the glory of God. The difference in goals. The escape response is meant to make things look good when they're really not. The attack response sacrifices peace and unity for selfish goals. It's what I want. And there's a difference in results, obviously. The greater probability for reconciliation through peacemaking. So when we think of these things, we're going to stop here. Um, and we'll pick up again tomorrow. Oops, sorry. There we go. I'll just finish with this last slide. The biblical view of conflict. Conflict is a difference in, in opinion or purposes that frustrate someone's goals or desire. The primary, primary causes of conflict is misunderstanding, differences in goals, values, gifts, calling, priorities, except, expectations, interests, and opinions. The competition over limited resources and sinful attitudes and habits. And I have tried to focus on particularly this one right here. Because in my experience, if you will, this, whether it's in a marriage, whether it's at work, whether it's in the assembly, the, the, the bottom line comes because my attitude and my sinful attitude and my habits. So may the Lord encourage us again as we think of the Lord Jesus as that great peacemaker. And, you know, the wonderful thing is when we think about this, that if it's a matter of my sinful attitudes, he says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? If it's a matter of my own inabilities to forgive you, and my own inabilities to be able to solve these problems, and, and I'm weak and I can't solve it, it says that we have such a great high priest. And you know, when we think about our great high priest, it says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's ever there interceding for us. And how it must thrill his heart when he sees us seeking to resolve things in a biblical way. Tomorrow morning, Lord willing, I'd just like to look at uh, some ways that we can hear one another. I want to try to be very practical tomorrow morning and just give some suggestions from the book of James as to what we hear. And being slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. And so may the Lord encourage us and, and as we think about this, and, and we, we have the booklet there that we put together and obviously, that was a 14-week course, and I've tried to throw it all in in two hours tonight. So I've moved fast, but if you really want to get into the subject, I would really encourage you, number one, get the book by Ken Sandy. Number two, 
go through that little booklet that we put together and do the worksheets and answer the questions and dig up the scriptures for yourself. And I think you'll find it to be very helpful. May the Lord bless each one of us. May we be encouraged in resolving conflicts, not letting them go, but resolving them. Maybe perhaps a brother could close us in prayer. in the assembly and not everybody is in favor of that or one person or whatever it might be. Is that what you're saying? Okay. I think uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 might help us with that. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 there's a verse in verse 12 and I'm going to read verse 12 through um, 13. He says, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So he says, recognize those that are elders among you, those that are taking that shepherd care, those that have been placed in that place of responsibility, not by man, but by the Holy Spirit, right? If we bring in Acts chapter 20, remember that it says, shepherd the flock of God, whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseer over. So it's the Holy Spirit who has placed them in that position. And he says to recognize those who labor, who, who are, the word there for labor is wearisome, working to the bone, so to speak, and are over you in the Lord. So they're taking that responsibility. They're trusted with that responsibility. And to esteem them very highly. The word highly is over, uh, over and abundantly. In love. For their work's sake. And then he says this. Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. So he says don't let their decisions irritate you. Be at peace among yourselves. And I think that when, when we think about the functioning. Whether it's at home. I mean I got to tell you that in my home. There have been many decisions my children haven't liked. But. There's an order to things at home, right? And bottom line is, dad's the head of the home. And so even though my children might not have liked it, there's an order that God has set up. There's an order in the local assembly as well. The Lord has brought different ones with that responsibility. The Holy Spirit has appointed them as elders. We didn't. Because what if, what if we appointed elders and we said... Well, I didn't like what that elder decided, so I would say, well, I didn't appoint him. It wasn't my choice, you know. I wanted Brother C because I like Brother C. I didn't appoint him. So the Holy Spirit appointed them. So that's one reason I believe that we don't appoint elders, but the Spirit of God appoints them. And then since he's placed them in that place of leadership, I am supposed to submit to that place of leadership, and I'm supposed to... According to scripture, I'm supposed to let them shepherd the flock of God. Interesting verse in 1 Peter in connection with this. And I'm sorry to be so long on, on that subject. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, he said, The elders who are among you I exhort. I who am a fellow elder, verse 1, chapter 5, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also partakers of the glory that will be revealed. So he says to them, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, that's a leader. And he says, shepherd, that's to feed them. And now overseeing, that's to lead them, not by compulsion, but willingly, not, as, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over them, those entrusted to you. So they're not supposed to lord it over us, the leaders, but being an example to the flock. Because here's the deal. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. The elders, the shepherds, the under shepherds, if you will, are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the way they shepherd the sheep. But then he says this, verse 5, 
Likewise, you younger people submit yourself to your elders. And then he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. And that's that thing that we've been talking about, that humility. So I don't know if those verses might help. Um, I think there's a manner of submission that uh, realizing that the Holy Spirit has placed a brother in that role of responsibility or brothers in that place of responsibility. And I need to acknowledge that, submit to it. I might not like it, but I might grow to understand it. Or when I get older and I'm in that place, maybe things will change. So I don't know if that answers that question or not. But the, the key, I think, especially to our subject, is that verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, at the very end, he says, be at peace among yourselves. Don't let this thing grow to be a conflict. Be at peace. Be at peace. 